Hi, I'm Pastor Chad. On behalf of the people at IHBC, I'm praying that you're blessed by this video. We're a people who know that God loves us and that it's His intent to shape us both through the truth of His Word and also in our fellowship together. If you're in the Silver City area, I want to take this opportunity to invite you to come out and join us. It would be our joy to get to know you. We know that Jesus stands with arms open, ready to receive you, and so do we. You'll find our church on the east edge of town, and you can see our flag on the side of 180. And now, we're praying you'll be blessed by this teaching from God's Word. All right. Well, as I said, it is, it's great to be back with you guys, the people of God, disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's great to be back in the house of the Lord for worship. And last week, our brother Bill, he walked us through what he called the terms of discipleship. And I want to follow up on what Bill talked about, kind of piggyback on what he said, take us back to where we left off a few weeks ago in our study of the Gospel of Matthew. And we have been studying through the entire Gospel of Matthew, a passage at a time, off and on for a little more than a year now. And today, we find ourselves in chapter 8, chapter 8 of Matthew's Gospel, where we see Jesus in the midst of a series of miracles that attest and affirm to his divine identity as the Son of God. And we've seen Jesus upon completing his Sermon on the Mount, he was met by a leper whom he healed. And he's met by an entirely different kind of man, a Roman centurion whose servant he also healed. And then we see in verse 14 of chapter 8 that Jesus went to Simon Peter's house. And the scripture says there, beginning in verse 14, that when Jesus entered Peter's house, he saw his mother-in-law lying sick with a fever, and he touched her hand, and the fever left her. And she rose and began to serve him. And that evening they brought to him many who were oppressed by demons, and he cast out the spirits with a word, and he healed all who were sick. And this was to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah. He took our illnesses and he bore our diseases. Now when Jesus saw a crowd around him, he gave orders to go over to the other side, that being the other side of the Sea of Galilee. And he was healing all kinds of afflictions and all kinds of people. And so right away in Jesus' ministry, on the heels of his heavenly teaching in the Sermon on the Mount, we see his heavenly healing. Glimpses of that heavenly promise that God is going to set things right. And in the person of Jesus, who is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, we see the kingdom of heaven has come near. And being moved by the power of his ministry, the crowd, they were, they were pressing in on him. The people are responding. Their interest is piqued and some sincerely desiring to follow him. Some of them eager, even zealous to follow him. Verse 19 says, a scribe came up and said to him, teacher, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes and the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. Another of the disciples said to him, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. And Jesus said, follow me and leave the dead to bury the dead. The scribe comes to him and he says, I'm in. I'm ready. I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus says, really? Do you know what you're saying? Do you really know what it means to say that you'll follow me? In Luke's account of this story, in Luke 9, he includes a third person. Yet another who said, I will follow you, Lord, but first let me say farewell to those at home. And Jesus said to him, no one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of heaven. In chapter 14 of Luke, we see Jesus again addressing this same issue with a couple of illustrations that he uses to explain what being his disciple truly entails. There in verse 27 of Luke 14, he says, whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. He says, for which of you desiring to build a tower does not first sit down and count the cost? whether he has enough to complete it. Otherwise, when he's laid a foundation and is not able to finish, 
All who see it begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king going out to encounter another king in war will not sit down first and deliberate whether he's able with 10,000 to meet him who comes against him with 20,000? And if not, then while the other is yet a great way off, he sends a delegation and asks for terms of peace. So therefore, Jesus says, any one of you who does not renounce all that he has cannot be my disciple. The point of all this being one consistent theme, there is a cost that comes with discipleship. Grace is unmerited, and salvation is the free offer of God in Christ. Jesus paid it all, and that much is absolutely true. Now, there is nothing you or I could do to purchase or earn our salvation, and salvation is the free offer of God in Jesus Christ. But that doesn't mean that when we come to salvation in Christ, that we then go back the same way we came right back to our old life and our old way of being that we endure no expense to ourself it doesn't mean that nothing is owed as the song says jesus paid it all but then what's the next line the very next line all to him i owe salvation is free but discipleship has a cost and jesus tells us what the cost is he says luke 14 33 Therefore, any one of you who does not renounce all that he has cannot be my disciple. Not because Jesus is exacting payment from you for his saving work. Not because there's anything you can do to purchase your salvation. But because following Christ, giving total allegiance to Christ, following him and leaving the world behind, it will require you to be prepared to give up everything. To let go of the things that you wouldn't readily be willing to part ways with in the flesh. And to be prepared to go places you wouldn't readily choose to go. And the question is this. How are you going to follow Christ if you're going to be held in place by the things that you cannot let go of? Or if you're not willing to move forward into places where he goes and where he calls that aren't places that you want to go? It's going to require... Sacrifice. It's going to require you to let go. There's going to be a cost. That's what he's saying to those who are eager to, eager to follow him here. They say, I want to follow you. Boldly, they say, I'll go wherever you go. And Jesus asks, are you really aware of what that entails? Have you truly considered what you're saying? Have you counted the cost? And there's a saying in our culture, it says you've got to pay the cost to be the boss. You know, the fact of the matter is, at the end of it all, there is only one true boss. There is only one sovereign king. And it's not you and it's not me. Jesus is the king of kings and the Lord of lords and his way comes with sacrifice and it comes with a cost. There is no cheap grace. Discipleship comes with a cost. Following Jesus will change your life, and that change will cost you some things. You've got to pay the cost to follow the boss. We need to understand the cost of discipleship. It's not simply believing in Jesus, getting baptized, spending the rest of our lives sitting in church listening to sermons. Those are things disciples are called to do, but those aren't the things that cost the cost of following Christ, it comes in the denial of the self and the detachment from the world. As Dietrich Bonhoeffer said, when Christ calls a man, he bid him come and die. In the sense that Paul says that by the mercies of God, we are to present our bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. This is our proper spiritual worship. Because the true disciple of Christ has been crucified with Christ. And it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And to be a disciple of Jesus Christ is to be crucified in the self and to live for him. To truly be obedient to Christ Jesus as Lord in our 
devotion and our love to yield all of ourselves, our possessions, our relationships, and our very lives to Him. To the end that while we are still blessed to have many things, we hold all of these things very, very loosely. And it's not the case in any way, shape, or form that we don't love or care for these things as we should. Our lives, our relationship, the steward, stewardship of our possessions, we are commanded by God to care deeply for these things in ways that honor God. But these things belong to God first. They are His. They are for His purpose. And as Job said, the Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And while we're blessed to receive abundant, countless, endless blessings from the Lord, nowhere in Scripture is it ever even implied that following Christ will cost you nothing. That it will be easy. That it will come with no sacrifice. Nowhere is it even implied that things won't be required of you. That you won't have to let go of some things. Or that you may have to follow where Jesus says to go rather than expect him to tag along on the journey that you take him on. It's just a simple fact of life. As you've likely experienced, if you're a true follower of Christ, that your relationship with Jesus is going to cost you some of your relationships. It's going to keep you from doing some of the things that perhaps sinfully you might really want to do. It's going to keep you from going to some of the places you might think that you'd rather go. It's going to require more of you than maybe you really wanted to give. The scribe in Matthew 8 came to Jesus and he said, Teacher, I will follow you wherever you go. Then Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes, the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. The scribe says, Jesus, I'll follow you anywhere. Anywhere. And Jesus says, really? Because you know I'm not on my way to a country club. I am headed for a crucifixion. I'm not headed for an earthly palace to sleep on sheets of Egyptian cotton. Not even close. But even the foxes have a hole in the ground and the birds have a nest in the tree. But not the Son of Man. I am not of this world. I will not be received by this world. And there's no place for me to lie down and be at peace and at rest in this world. The Son of Man has no place to rest his head. Not until, he says, I've reached the cross. And whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. That is the cause of discipleship. There is a cause to follow the boss. To truly become a disciple of Christ, to truly follow him in the sense that he means it here, is to be joined together with him. As followers of Christ, we are united to him. To do as he does, to go with him where he goes, to stand where he stands, to humble ourselves and go low where he goes low. And to be united to him, it requires that we then become disunited from the world. A follower of Christ clings to him relentlessly and holds all else very loosely. The follower of Christ has his anchor in the heavens in Christ and not in the things of this world, and therefore... The Christian sinks very shallow roots into this earth. Where have you sunk your roots? Where are you anchored? What are you clinging to? Is it Christ alone? Because the reality is, for the Christian, we are called to obey what Jesus says, when he says, and where he says, whatever his will is. Maybe. And that's a very difficult thing to do if you are rooted and anchored or clinging to anything else. Therefore, Jesus says, Luke 14, 33, any one of you who does not renounce all that he has cannot be my disciple. It's not easy to be a follower of Jesus. There is a cause to follow the boss. We can try to twist and contort and rationalize this statement in Luke 14. And we ask, renounce all that I have? Really all 
that I have. And maybe it won't all be asked of you all at one time. And maybe it will. But Jesus says we have to be prepared to renounce all that we have. And as I've heard it said, all means all, and that is all all means. To be a disciple is to be united to Christ and to be detached from all else. Because the follower of Christ who hears the word of God recognizes that as James says in James 1, every good and perfect gift actually comes from the Father. As we heard John the Baptist say just a few weeks ago, a person cannot receive even one thing unless it is given him from heaven. It all comes from God. And the disciple of Christ recognizes that it's all God's. It was his to begin with. It's his to do with as he pleases. It's him who's given us everything we have. It's his to give and it's his to take away. And so I ask, have we renounced all that we have? Have we handed it over to God? And Jesus asks, have you counted the cost? Are you ready to renounce all that you have? And the only way that we can come to do this is to be able to say confidently, in the power of the Spirit, God, it's all yours. I am yours. All I have is yours. I place it all in your hands, and I trust you. You do with it what you will. Because the truth is, whether we're prepared to admit it or not, it's, it's already His. If we have it, it's because it's all been given to us by Him. And it's His to do with what He wills. And whether we're prepared to permit Him or not, He has access to every bit of it at every moment. And it's not until we recognize that and we let go of all else, surrendering it all to God and clinging to Christ alone, that we then can be free, free to follow Christ. And to be a disciple of Christ is to be free. Whom the Son sets free is free indeed. And not just free from enslavement to sin, but free from the entanglement of all this earthly stuff. To follow Jesus is to be a disciple. It requires that we lay everything down and being free from the attachment to all these earthly things is freedom. And it's only when we're free from these things that we can truly follow Jesus anywhere he goes. The disciple of Christ lives with but is not anchored to or ensnared by all these things that God has given to us. That's what we see in these passages. In Matthew 8, we see Jesus confronting the earthly attachment of these two men. He warns them that unless they're prepared to let go, they won't be able to be his disciples. The third person we saw in Luke 9, 27, he warns against looking back. He says, no one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. In Luke 14, he likens being his disciple to a great undertaking, like building a tower or entering into a great battle. And he gives his warning about what happens when people enter into such monumental undertakings lightly. They fail. They face shame. They fold. They surrender. They give in to the enemy. He makes clear to anyone who would choose to follow him, being a disciple of Christ, it's not an easy undertaking. This isn't something a person enters into lightly without counting the cost. There is a cost to follow the boss. In Matthew 19, Jesus said to the rich young ruler, Go, sell all you have, and then come and follow me. When the young man heard that saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. And he wasn't willing to make the sacrifice to endure the cost. And instead, he gave up Christ. He gave up reconciliation to God. He gave up eternal joy forever, merely to hold on to his temporary, fleeting, earthly stuff. Jesus knew that the young ruler's possessions were going to keep him from being able to be a devoted follower. They had a hold on the young ruler's heart. 
Jesus doesn't require that every person sell everything they have. Not everybody. But he does require that we be willing to. To give up anything that we're attached to, anything that would hold us captive and keep us from going where he's going. Anything that has a hold on us, anything that we haven't yet handed over to him, it entangles us, it ensnares us, it keeps us from being free. As Tyler Durden said in Fight Club, if you don't understand the call to hold all things with an open hand, then you don't understand that the things you own end up owning you. And that's the warning Jesus is giving. If you follow me, you follow one who has no place to lay his head. You follow one who can't stop to bury the dead. You follow one who can't turn back once his hand is on the plow. You follow one who completes what he started. You follow a king who's waging a war in which peace cannot be made with the enemy. He says, are you sure you're ready to follow me? Have you counted the cost? Have you considered just what it is that you're going to need to make peace with letting go of? Have you handed it over to God? Are you free? Are you free to follow Jesus? Do you own it? Or does it own you? God may require it all from you. Or you may be blessed to be a steward of a great many things. But no one who is Christ's disciple can be held captive by anything. You may be counting the cost right now. You may be asking yourself, why would I want to live in such a way? In the 19th century, Italian revolutionary Giuseppe Garibaldi set out to liberate Italy. And he went about the villages recruiting young people to come and join and enlist in the cause, to come and follow him in the fight. And the people asked him, they said, why should we follow you? What do you offer? Offer? Garibaldi said, I offer you hardship, hunger, rags, thirst, sleepless nights, foot sores, long marches, privations innumerable, and finally, victory in the noblest cause that ever confronted you. The people in the scripture that we've looked at this morning, they don't ask Jesus what he offers. They've seen he has something that they want. They say, we want to come, we want to follow you. And rather than throwing open the tailgate of the bandwagon and saying, come on, climb aboard. Or lowering the, the bar for entry or hiding the challenges that lay ahead. Going about selling them on the re reward of eternity. Instead, he responds by offering them their cross. He warns us, anyone who does not take up his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Have you considered the cost? Have you counted the cost of discipleship? Have you considered the cross? In the scripture, we're going to see again and again that it's no new thing that learning of the cost or being faced with the challenges that come with following Jesus that leads many, many people, even those initially interested and eager to follow Christ, to turn and to walk away. But nowhere in the scripture are we told the Christian life is an easy one. We're merely told it's the best one. It's the blessed one. And ultimately, it's the only one. For the wages of sin is death. But Jesus Christ is life. And the reward for the follower of Christ, the one who follows him and endures to the end, is eternal life in him. But it's not cheap. Nothing about God is cheap. Nothing about the work of God in Christ is cheap. Not the salvation purchased by the blood of Christ, not the ransom for our lives, not the spirit as a guaranteed down payment on our inheritance, not the calling of God on the Christian, and not the new life that's commanded of us. God's work is of unfathomable value. And Jesus is calling those who would come after him to comprehend the weight and the value of God's grace. Jesus will not allow us to treat God's grace as if 
It's cheap. It is of infinite value. There was a German theologian named Dietrich Bonhoeffer. He wrote a book called The Cost of Discipleship. And in that book, he addressed this very issue. He wrote of the danger of making light of the cost of following Christ and the cheapening of the value of the love that God has shown for us in his grace. Ultimately, Bonhoeffer would demonstrate the cost of discipleship with his very life. He was imprisoned in a Nazi concentration camp for his ardent stand against the Third Reich, and at 39 years old, he was put to death for his accused alleged involvement in a plot to end the life of Adolf Hitler. Being prepared to lose his life for the cause of Christ, he was convicted to stand when many Lutheran church leaders at the time, recognizing the cost and holding on to earthly life, they withered in the face of certain evil. But of the cost of discipleship and the costly grace that he tasted, which had made him different, Bonhoeffer wrote, Cheap grace is the deadly enemy of the church. We are fighting today for costly grace. Cheap grace means grace sold on the market like cheap Jax's wares. The sacraments, the forgiveness of sin, and the consolations of religion are thrown away at cut prices. Grace is represented as the church's inexhaustible treasury from which she showers blessings with generous hands without asking questions or fixing limits. Grace without price. Grace without cost. The essence of grace, we suppose, is that the account has been paid in advance, and because it has been paid, then everything can be had for nothing. It means the justification of sin without the justification of the sinner. Grace alone does everything they say, and so everything can remain just as it was before. All for sin could not atone. Well, then let the Christian live like the rest of the world. Let him model himself on the world's standards in every sphere of life and not presumptuously aspire to live a different life under grace from his old life under sin. Cheap grace is the grace we bestow on ourselves. Cheap grace is the preaching of forgiveness without requiring repentance. Baptism without church discipline. Communion without confession. Cheap grace is grace without discipleship. Grace without the cross. Grace without Jesus Christ living and incarnate. Costly grace is the treasure hidden in the field. For the sake of it, a man will gladly go and sell all that he has. It's the pearl of great price to buy which the merchant will sell all his goods. It's the kingly rule of Christ for whose sake a man will pluck out the eye which causes him to stumble. It is the call of Christ at which the disciple leaves his nets and his boats and follies. Such grace is costly because it calls us to follow, and it is grace because it, falls, it calls us to follow Jesus Christ. It is costly because it costs a man his life, and it is grace because it gives a man the only true life. It is costly because it condemns sin, and grace because it justifies the sinner. Above all, it is costly because it costs God the life of his Son, Yea, we were, brought, we were bought with a price, and what has cost God much cannot be cheap for us. Costly grace is the incarnation of God. Costly grace confronts us as a gracious call to follow Jesus. It comes as a word of forgiveness to the broken spirit and the contrite heart. Grace is costly because it compels a man to submit to the yoke of Christ and follow him. It is grace because Jesus says, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. This warning that's undergirding this whole matter is that if you treat grace like it's cheap, you hold a low value of your relationship with God and of what he's done for you, or if you expect this walk with Christ to come easily, you're going to find that what you're actually believing, what you're actually placing your faith in, what you're putting your eternal hope in, it's not real Christianity at all, but a flimsy imitation of our own design. And it would be the most unloving and unkind thing to not warn you against that, and that's why Jesus serves his invitation with 
his warning. Because to make light of the cost, to make grace cheap, you're not going to respond to God's grace as you should. You're not going to grow and heal and be whole as you should. You're not going to derive the joy from your relationship with God that you should. Ultimately, if you treat grace like it's cheap, you're going to be deeply confused when you find out that following Christ gets hard. It gets really hard. In the passage, Jesus is letting us know. If you don't know that and expect that, if the gospel faith that comprehends that hasn't taken root in your heart, you're likely going to find that you didn't enter this journey free from entanglements, prepared to persevere in hardship. And like so many, you'll be tempted to turn away, to return home, just as soon as more is required of you than you'd anticipated. Like the seed in the parable of the sower that sprouts up quickly, when the adversity and difficulty comes, it withers and it fades away. Many, having initially been eager to follow Christ, end up returning to earthly attachments, seeking joy and fulfillment in other places that were never really designed to provide what our soul is truly longing for and becoming increasingly distant from the Lord. This cheap grace that so many have traded for true discipleship is what Warren Wearsby called cotton candy Christianity. It looks so good on the surface. It's all the sweet stuff and all the fluff, and when you bite into it, it disintegrates, and it's just empty. It doesn't have any weight. It doesn't have the substance to answer your hunger in your soul. It's not what you actually need or even knowing better what you truly want. And when the difficulty in life comes, it's nothing more than a faith that will wither and shrink and disintegrate like nothing more than a puff of pink fluff. Genuine faith is a faith that sustains. As the Apostle Paul said, I have learned to be content. Whatever the situation, I know how to be brought low. I know how to abound in any and every circumstance. I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. You may be offered hardship, hunger, rags, thirst, sleepless nights, foot sores and long marches, and privations innumerable. But finally, in Christ, you are being offered victory in the noblest cause that ever confronted you, in the only cause of eternal consequence. So what will you do? Knowing the cost, Will you turn and walk away, or will you take up your cross? And as you do, will you count the cost? It's the fool who begins building a tower without first considering the cost and whether he has enough to complete it. It's the fool who sends a delegation to war without considering first if he has the troops to succeed. It's the fool who takes lightly the cost of following Christ. Any one of you who does not renounce all that he has cannot be my disciple. Count the cost. Consider the calling. So you'll be able to finish the task. I want to encourage you. Follow him. Because he is worthy. Persevere because it is worth it. There is a cost to follow the boss. And he is a fool who does not first count the cost. But as the famous missionary Jim Elliot said, he is no fool who gives up all he cannot keep to gain that which he can never lose. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord God, I thank you for your son's perfect honesty for his putting this right up front of his calling. When we come to him, he lets us know what we enter into. Father, help us comprehend the weight of glory, the value 
of grace. The, co- the price that your son paid. So that we would then understand the importance of bearing the cost of discipleship. Father, what you've extended to us in your son is of a value so far superior and so much more important than anything that we have ever been offered in all of our existence. Father, give us a heart that recognizes it, that sees it, that grasps it, that takes hold of it, and that would follow him wherever he goes. That would renounce all things that we would be able. Father, move by your spirit upon us. Bring a change in us. Enliven us, awaken us in Christ that we would be able to follow him and persevere to the end. That we would be able to have eternal joy with him forever. Father, it's by the aid of your spirit that in the majesty authority of your son, Jesus Christ, to you we pray. Amen.